Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest Young Farmers podcast episode in which we're talking about tenants, landlords, collaboration, and how you can develop your part in agriculture. So not much. Um, I'm Beth Eagle. I'm a rural affairs podcaster and journalist. And today we're going to look at the case of Chris Lake, um, who's been through the process of applying for a farm tenancy, but has also explored share farming and other ways of accessing land. So hopefully you can learn some lessons from his story. Chris is with me alongside a panel of guests, including George Dunn, who is Chief Executive of the Tenant Farmers Association, Martin Lines, a Cambridgeshire farmer and CEO of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, and Cameron Hughes, who is a land use policy advisor at the Country Land and Business Association. So together, we're going to be exploring the barriers into the industry, as well as what we might be able to do about this and potential opportunities as well. First up, though, uh, let's bring you in, Chris. So you're not from a farming background. You did your first harvest season shortly after passing your driving test. You went to the RAU. Uh, You currently work as a farm business consultant and you farm in evenings and weekends and are looking to secure a tenancy. But I just wonder if you can give us flavour of your farming journey so far, your career journey, but also critically, because we talk about tenancies first and foremost, why you want a tenancy? So um, I obviously started, like you said, with my first harvest season, uh, very shortly after passing my driving test. That was on a large 4,000 acre farm. And that was on two ring fence sites about 15 miles apart. And it was during that that I then decided that I'd apply to university to study agriculture, which was a baptism of fire, given I'd had no prior education in agriculture before going straight to degree level. Through my summers and some relief work throughout the year, I was then working on a regenerative farm not too far from Martins. And that's where I really took to nature-friendly farming, uh, regenerative agriculture, and seeing what experimental techniques could work to uh, not only be profitable, but be kinder to nature. After university, I joined an agricultural accountancy in Norfolk that was based in Norwich. And so that year I did apply for a tenancy in Norfolk, but was unsuccessful. And then since that, I have moved back close to home and I'm back in Cambridgeshire and was unsuccessful with an application for a tenancy there as well this year. But I am looking forward to seeing what tenancy opportunities come around the corner uh, in the new year. Farming wise, I have grown my business since coming back to Cambridgeshire with some Cambridgeshire sheep that I am grazing on stubble turnip and other cover crops on farms that I've previously worked for and neighbouring farms as well. I have land that I am renting in Cambridgeshire and Norfolk and now Suffolk too. Um, in, In terms of barriers, let's just go through this. So from your point of view, what have been the biggest barriers for you in in trying to secure a tenancy, but trying to like secure a place really on the on, on the first rung of the ladder? I think the the two largest barriers are access to land and access to finances. Other than that, skills and training is fairly widely available, but I found that land was the hardest thing to get hold of, and it's only through connections that I've made through work or young farmers that I've been able to get the um, land that I am now covering. And I'd much rather consolidate that into a much smaller area that I'm covering instead of having to move, constantly be moving between Norfolk, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire. Yeah, for sure. Some people might be listening to this and just to play devil's advocate for a bit. And certainly um, I've had this conversation with with others on, on other podcasts, but they might say, why not look for a farm manager position that there are plenty of other roles within the industry um, without taking on a tenancy? Having having worked on farms for a number of years, uh, especially whilst I was doing my degree, I didn't like the stress that I was put under knowing that it wasn't for my own benefit. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you can, well, you can go and work on a farm and get a salary and know that you'll get paid that salary every year and it's not dependent on how well your livestock or crops do. But I'd much rather take on the risk and get all of the benefit from it as well. Okay. And just finally, um, your vision for sort of five years' time, where would you like to be in five years' time? Oh, I, ideally, I'd have uh, a council tenancy or a private tenancy, but I'm not counting my eggs too soon. Yes. Uh, right, let's bring in our panel. Um, and just straight away, I suppose, I, I just want to hear from each of you as to whether there's anything 
um, that jumps out initially in terms of Chris's story um, that that's either of interest to you um, and whether you'd have any initial advice just based on what you've heard so far. George, I'm going to go straight over to you first. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And thanks, Chris, for just sharing your story and your experiences. My advice would be just keep on getting that experience, um, developing your capital, developing your track record, and pushing at whatever doors of opportunity come your way. And take the downs with the ups and understand how you can improve going forward. But you know, I am a bit concerned, uh, Ben, about the extent to which people, when we talk about new entrants, talk about people having to be farmers in their own account, uh, business mm-hmm. people in their own account, you know, people who've gone to university to study medicine or law or accountancy. You wouldn't expect them to come out of university and set up their own medicine practices, legal practices, or accountancy practices. You know, they, they'd be working for other people, but obviously, eventually, they may set up their own businesses. And, and we need to see this as a continuum. So not everything will come to you today. But persevere and look for those opportunities, gain that experience, develop your capital, and uh, I'm sure you'll shine. Okay. Martin, your initial thoughts? Uh, I, I, just really interesting to hear, this, hear how you've got on and the challenges you've met. I mean, one thing that leapt out at me was the additional cost you must bear as where you're farming in many counties and moving livestock and running around to look after thing. That's not always appreciated uh, and, and sort of understood and so you're disadvantaged by having to pick up bits of land here and there. It's important how quickly you can consolidate to, or you know, have support in recognising the additional costs you, you, you're incurring. Cameron? Thanks. Well, it seems like you're doing all, this, all, the, all the right things, Chris, and it sounds like you've got your foot in the door to an extent with these current situations you've got in, in Suffolk and in Cambridgeshire. But I, I wondered how you kind of managed to get your foot in the door with those are they are they tenancies or are they sort of grazing agreements or is it something sort of a, a gentleman's agreement or something or how, how's it working it's a it, it's a combination of both so um fortunately through um my accountancy and consultancy work i have such a huge network of farmers and landowners that i've asked very nicely and in some cases i have grazing agreements in some cases it's an agreement where they plant the cover crop and my sheep will graze it and there's no actual financial transaction. <laughs> That's how I've done it. And it's just quite busy, quite busy trying to keep track of them all. I feel like getting getting that sort of initial foot in the door, you know, is, is often the hardest part. And it, it, it seems like you're sort of well underway, you know, with a sort of longer term tendency being the, being the ultimate goal. It sounds like also you're pretty kind of looped in i know we might get on to talking about networks later but as you as you'll know today so, so much of these kind of opportunities depend on the strength of your own network and who, who you know and whether or not you might get talked to before something goes goes up for let more widely and i guess getting your name out there and i guess establishing your reputation is probably as important as anything so those opportunities might come your way you know down the track it's really interesting you made that point, Cameron, and I, I know we're going to address that later, but let's start by honing in really on, on tenancies themselves. And George, uh, you're the person to start with here. So um, can you just give us an overview of the situation for new entrants in terms of who's being successful in securing tenancies? How many of these are actually going to new entrants uh, to farming? What do we mean by a new entrant? Yeah, well, maybe I'll start with that last question, Ben. What do we mean by uh, a new entrant? Uh, I mean, and certainly hearing what Chris has to say, he's he's clearly managed to get some opportunity. It may not be the opportunity that he wants or the opportunity that he desires, but he is already a new entrant. He's he's entered the industry and he is involved in agricultural activity. And I think for so many people like Chris and others, it's almost about more about progression than it is about entry. So there's lots of opportunity to get your foot in the door, as Cameron was saying, but finding those progression opportunities when you find that the shoe is already pinching on your business aspirations when you get that first opportunity is, is really important. But the data that we often refer to is the data that's collected by the Central Association of Agricultural Valuers. They have an annual land occupation survey and that survey from 2022 suggests that around 11% of all new tenancies offered are going to people who might be defined as new entrants and interestingly 
uh, over a third of uh, opportunities where there's a change in the occupier on the tenancy are going to new entrants. So the difference being that some new tenancies are being granted to individuals who have already been in occupation as tenants, but whose agreements are coming to a conclusion. So yeah, over a third of opportunities where there's a change in occupier are apparently going to new entrants. So the same survey suggests that last year there was probably around a thousand new tenancies offered in the market, and that's significantly lower than we've seen in previous years. So 20 years ago, it would have been double that number of tenancies in in the marketplace. So on the basis of 11% of those opportunities going to new entrants, there's around 100 opportunities that new entrants are clearly picking up within the agricultural tenancy world. But I also think it bears understanding that there's a real issue here with the average length of term that people are being offered. So the average length of term on new agreements is just three and a half years just over three and a half years. Yeah. Now, although equipped units will have an average length of term of just short of 10 years, we're still seeing around 80% of all new tenancies let for periods of five years or less. And that's a huge issue if you're having to borrow money, uh, like uh, Chris was talking about, to, to capitalize your business and to get it up and running. And also for some of the environmental outcomes that people are quite keen to do these days, you know, a, a tenancy of less than five years is, is, is really short. So uh, that's the sort of makeup of the current situation within the talented sector. Right. Cameron, I wonder if you can just pick up on that point George made there about duration of tenancies and, and perhaps why that might be from a landlord's perspective. But also on a broader sort of picture, what landlords agents are actually looking for when a prospective new entry comes to an interview, what are they actually looking for? I guess as an agent, having been in this position before in previous jobs, you're there to deliver on what your clients asked you to do, um, help them meet meet their objectives. And, you know, thankfully for people in Chris's situation, many landlords, particularly larger institutional landlords, have a particular focus in new entrants or perhaps some of the council farms. You know, landlords sit on a spectrum and some of them, you know, would like to see particular things delivered through their tenancies, having worked for some like the National Trust previously. What they might look for as far as a tenant goes might look quite different from a sort of private private landlord. Um, Some would be more motivated by how they want the land to be managed as opposed to sort of the rental income. Some will be primarily motivated by rental income and be less sort of uh, prescriptive in terms of how the land might be managed and then also there are different reasons for why landlords might want to issue tenancies of of varying lengths you know they might have their own kind of internal wider strategic plans which might mean that some shorter tenancy might be more favorable in in terms of their own plans compared to a longer one chris didn't didn't mention it when we were talking about barriers earlier but i suppose particularly as far as new entrants go and this probably was always going to come back at some point but there's a greater risk as far as landlords go in, t- in, in terms of taking on a new entrant. Well, that's that's perception. We've had a lot of calls with landlords um, in and around DEFRA's new entrant pilot, pilot scheme talking about barriers and how to address them. And so absence of a, of a proven kind of track record, it, it's a risk for landowners looking, on, looking to take on new entrants. I guess the flip side to that is that they come with, you know, fresh ideas, different approaches, which can, you know, be very useful. Yeah, I I accept it's a much higher risk to take on a new tenant rather than someone with a proven background uh, and a proven business. But eventually those people will dry up if the new entrants are never never given a chance. I definitely wouldn't be in the same position uh, that I'm in now if people didn't take a risk initially. George, we often hear that young people interested in getting into farming or or new entrants should be realistic when it comes to the opportunity of tenancies. I've heard that word a lot, but what does that mean? And what message would you send to new entrants looking to secure a tenancy, but especially people like Chris who are dead set on on going down that tenancy route? Yeah, so I I think I've already made the point about uh, the experience side and the extent to which individuals need to think about gaining that uh, before they put their hat in the ring for opportunities that landlords are prepared to offer. But I think it's also important just to realize that we are in a very highly competitive environment when it comes to to land. You know, they're not making any more land. Land is a scarce resource and when it becomes available, 
routinely there are multiples of individuals who are interested in, in taking over that land or, or taking on that business opportunity. So that means that you really have to shine. You really do have to shine uh, and show your your worth. So that means turning up to viewing days, asking intelligent questions, um, being interested in what's going on, getting good advice, understanding how to put together a really good business plan, which involves you know, putting together a budget, a cash flow, a net worth calculation so that the, the, the landlord, like Cameron was talking about, can see, yeah, he might be taking a risk, but they can see that you thought about your financials and you've, you've gone into some detail about those. Now, it's okay to get someone to assist you to put together that business plan or those financials, but at the end of the day, you've really got to own that plan. You've got to own those numbers so that when you come to an interview, you can answer uh, questions on it. And and also, you know, like Chris has found, you are going to get some knockbacks and you shouldn't make those knockbacks um, uh, cause you to give up the journey. You know, they are part and parcel of of, of where we are and, and you need to get up and try and try and try again. You know, I had a, I had a young man who was a, a, a participant in the National Federation of Farmers Clubs Farm De- Development Competition many years ago, who on his first try completely bombed, got nowhere. And in, and in fact, in, in after the interview he had with us, he, he was in tears, uh, bless him. But he right. came back for a second year and he had another go and he, he came second. And in the third yeah. year he won. You know, so yeah. he he won yeah. the prize. So it's about that that uh, that perseverance, and also finally, it's important to spread your net as widely as possible. You know, it's, it's un- unlikely that an opportunity will come up on your doorstep. So you need to be thinking about, well, is there somewhere else in the country that perhaps I can I can uh, develop my business? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. Generally, it's like sort of you know, failure is part and parcel of life, isn't it? But it, it doesn't mean that it's it might be a no for now, but it's a, not a no forever necessarily absolutely just looking at this broadly though in terms of the messaging and and how we talk about opportunities to what extent do you think that we should actually be saying go and look for other opportunities as well perhaps first that includes farm manager positions perhaps rather than necessarily securing a tenancy and that being the be all and end all well i think i think like chris said and he said it sort of in, in a negative way you know yeah you're 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 having a guaranteed income you're working very hard. You are uh, not at risk in terms of your your own capital as as a farm manager. But actually, you know, there's a lot to be said for your first years in leaving university, having that guaranteed income, those holidays, the the fact that your your capital is not at risk, and you're you're learning all the time. And and even if you're learning how not to do stuff on a farm, it's as important as to learn how to do stuff. And and to say, well, if I had my own place, I'd do that completely differently, or or I would I would change things around, or I would manage things in a very in a very different way. So uh, to my mind, it's a really great way to gain that experience before taking the leap into the into a business on your own and 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 use that itch that you have to want to be in business by yourself to to learn as much as you possibly can along the way so take the fact that there's some guaranteed income and some holidays and, and a house maybe and maybe an, a car with a job who knows but and then use that as the basis for really designing your future Thanks. Um, I am going to move on because I'm conscious of time. So we're now going to discuss the policy sort of side of things. And Martin, you've been sitting there very patiently. Let, let, let's bring you, bring you in. Um, we were told that new entrants would be a core part of the new agricultural transition plan. Um, and we have had a pilot looking at this. So I just wonder if you could give us an update on where we are now when it comes to government support in terms of the offering for new entrants. Uh, yeah, we were told yeah, new entrants were going to be key, but government and, and the transition is missing significant opportunities to uh, assist and help new entrants getting into the space. And, and I think uh, the lack of information around uh, what SFI and AML would be is helping make that really challenging to do a budget going forward. Many, you know, all farmers are challenging to that. So I think they really are holding back that opportunity. And we're seeing from the pilots and other bits that there is focus there, but there's very poor joined up and delivery. The future of where we need to look is how do we stack enterprises and, and, and fight, give new entrants opportunities to access the land for grazing, for doing operations while they build their business. Because we're going to look at a, a future where uh, there'll be SFI or other opportunities of delivering 
not just food from our landscapes, but other opportunities. And it's how do we, as established farmers, offer new people those opportunities to build their capital asset in buying machinery and doing jobs and make sure we are trying to bring in new people to give them the opportunity to grow some capital asset and their, their trading platform to then have a good resilient business to go out and put a tender in for that um, tenancy further down the line. Cameron, do you want to come on that in terms of should we be sharing these opportunities? I mean, definitely. I guess one of the problems we've got at the moment is we've got this legacy scheme hangover, particularly with BPS, which is like a, a prerequisite to entering some of the schemes at the moment, like SFI, like the free advice that DEF is offering to BPS recipients until March 25. So I think in time, those opportunities will be opened up and hopefully from next year when that BPS eligibility requirement drops off. George, on this point as well, I mean, how realistic is it for a new entrant to make a living purely from farming? Should should we be thinking of farming alongside another job such as Chris or having a second non-food production income stream? Is it is it unrealistic to say for now your your sole income will be through farming? I think very sadly, Ben, in the current marketplace, it is unrealistic to say that new entrants are going to be able to sustain their livelihood just from farming for food. Uh, I mean, obviously, those individuals who have the opportunity to to look at diversification, you know, look at public facing stuff, look at um, retailing, look at farm experience, you know, those are different kettles of fish. And as Chris said, you need security to develop those types of, of arrangement. And sadly, In my view, there's a market failure here in that landlords are not providing the necessary security for people like Chris to develop those sorts of businesses. So I think inevitably we are going to be in a situation for a very long time that people are going to have to be plural in their economic existence. And, uh, you know, people need to be farmers in their hearts and their heads uh, on this. So it's not just a a heart issue. You really do need your head. And, and yeah, so those those other opportunities are going to be part and parcel of of, of the new entrant uh, landscape for for a while to come. I think. Talk about training, George. To what extent do we have sufficient and effective training opportunities for young people interested in getting into ag? In your view, I mean, do we need a mindset shift towards perhaps lifelong learning, improving skills over time? Is there perhaps too much focus that you have to do all your training and and, and learn everything to start with, and then on you go, get on your way? Yeah, I mean, Ben, but there, there is the concept in whatever walk of life that you're in that every day is a school day and that you should never stop learning, never stop finding new ways to do stuff, never stop trying to develop yourself. So there's the, there's always room for continuing development and continuing training. But I think one of the major issues that we face as an industry, and I don't know whether Chris has got something to say about this, is about providing a really good and safe network for people to get work experience before they come into the sorts of college or university courses that are training people into agriculture. So it's okay for those of us who are involved in the industry and and we where we've got you know people looking at uh, at coming into the industry as young people because we can always tap up our contacts for those sorts of work experience opportunities. But I speak to people on a regular basis outside of the industry who just have got no clue how to get that work experience and and certainly schools and careers offices and schools who have people who are expressing an interest to come into the industry are at sea when it comes to finding those work experience opportunities for individuals so i think there's something here maybe for the ahdb or or the new institute of agriculture horticulture to think about how we put in place that really important opportunity for people to get safe and valuable work experience before they go into university or or college. Because one, one of the things that I often say to people when they talk to me about coming into the industry is you need to take off your rose tinted spectacles because, you know, this is not going to be necessarily an easy uh, darling buds and May type experience. And having those work experience opportunities just give, gives a reality check to people. Most people come away loving it. But some people think, actually, it's not for me. But So I think that's where we need to do a bit of work. Chris, does that sound sensible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I first got involved with farming through young farmers. The lad I sat next to in GCSE chemistry asked if I wanted to come along to the meeting that night. And I did. And I haven't really, haven't really looked back since. I mean, I, I used to skip my, well, I used to skip some lessons. And I used to use my free lessons 
uh, at sixth form as well to go and work on the farm at the other end of the village that my friend was working on. So I was able to go and get some experience that way. And I mean, it's, once I passed my driving test, I must have printed off a letter with a short CV and gone around 25, 30 farms within a 15 mile radius of uh, my parents' house just to get that harvest experience. And from that, I not only got the first work experience that I did, but the following farming experiences as a result of that. Having done an agricultural degree, yes, there's a lot to learn. I feel like some of the teachings are a bit antiquated in terms of there being a real lack of emphasis on regenerative or environmental schemes. And admittedly, that's all coming to a head and changing now as as we go. But really, that should be getting implemented into the degree courses and probably into the college courses as well. I mean, I don't have any experience of those. But admittedly, the government are doing something um, education wise. I mean, they're incentivizing farmers to host farm visits from schools. And I think if they push that and farmers got more on board with that, then we'd see more people getting interested in um, into the industry as well. How, how set up to many of your NWFN farmers feel, I suppose, in terms of would they be able to host such sort of training schemes, um, helping new entrants sort of get into the getting into the industry, but also ongoing training? How, how would that go down with your members, do you think? Uh, extremely welcome and it's something we get asked an awful lot uh, that appear to be learning bringing new people onto farms and school children and others and and just sharing what's going on the many of the new practices that people are going to start delivering around regenerative nature friendly practices the older generation and people coming out of university haven't got those practices uh you know haven't had the training and it's learning from others that have been trying to do things um and i think that's a huge opportunity some of the downsides, though, is someone who tries to host lots of visits. It's not just the visit, it's the hand wash and the toilet facilities. You can get a grant for the hosting, but not for the infrastructure again. So it, it falls back on to the to the farmer who hosts that. But I do think that's a huge opportunity for new, new entrants and new people to immerse themselves in that world of regenerative farming practices. And, and they could be a leading voice and role in, you know, in the older generation and supporting an owner-occupier or somebody else. In, in delivering and become a, a, an opportunity and getting a tendency that way of being that supportive employee or staff member. Yeah. And then also just briefly uh, with your farmer hat on and through your own career hat on, I suppose, uh, just, just reflecting back and, and it depends on your role within the industry. It depends what you're doing. It depends what career you want, but for you, what does career progression look like in, in agriculture on a farm level at the moment? And, how can new entrants ensure that they are always developing themselves? Make themselves known, get, get involved. But I think that's a responsibility for, for farmers, giving people opportunity to come and do things. But that's also increasingly challenging sometimes because to put somebody on a tractor and trailer and send them off corn carts and running up and down a road without the experience and training. So it's how do we build that in and bring them in when we're not at peak times and give them some work experience and opportunity to learn when we're not all rushing around. Cameron, you spoke uh, right at the beginning of this conversation about uh, building networks, relationship building, and, and the importance of that. To what extent do you think that is that is really important? So what, what level of importance does that play to be building connections with farmers and landowners? And, and could there be potential opportunities by doing that? Yeah, it's highly important. I'm often struck by sort of how how small a world farming is. Um, relationship building is a really key part. I suppose the challenge is perhaps for someone, someone in, at Chris's stage is to sort of where to target your energies because I know you've got you know your your current holdings in Cambridgeshire, Norfolk, etc. But you know, in order to know about opportunities at you know another end of the country, it's a challenge to know sort of where to sort of develop your network and how to invest your time. I've certainly been in situations where, you know, looking to let farms and, you know, certain people come unrecommended, if you like, which, you know, may, may, be, may be unfair, but, uh, you know, it, do, it doesn't necessarily help their chances when it comes to reviewing a tender that they put forward together. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's important. And I guess you don't know when opportunities are going to come up, whether they're going to be, you know, next week or in, or in 10 years time, um, whether it's off the back of a conversation that you might have, you know, tomorrow and not think about, you know, for, for a long period of time afterwards. Cameron, just going back to you, and I suppose the role of professional advice in this, it, it, it might see, there might be people listening to this who are actually thinking, 
well, yeah, I, I need some advice, but how necessary do you think that this is? Um, advice is often helpful. I guess experience, you know, we've talked a lot about experience and building that up. And uh, that's obviously equally, if not more important, I'd have said. One scheme that we're trying to promote quite hard at the moment is the DEFRA Future Farming Resilience Fund, which is free government funding advice. Unfortunately, that's one of the ones you've got to be uh, eligible for, uh, for BPS uh, in order to apply. But there's a range of different agribusiness consultants that you can have come out to your farm and deliver some some tips. Sorry, Chris, you're going to come back. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, just before you do, I just wonder, do you just tell us if you've actually sourced any advice before? I have. I'm, I'm actually a rural business consultant who is offering advice through the FFRF. Uh, and I've been up and down the country uh, giving advice to people with 50 acres of strawberries, to people with 1,800 acres of arable land and yeah people this, sorry sorry yeah so the, the, this is sort of my point but almost because you're an advisor is that this is why i'm interested in this do you think yeah. there's actually still value even as an advisor there's still value in getting advice from others most of my advice comes from me asking the other consultants in the office from an agronomy point of view i have friends that are i mean i'm currently doing my basis but i have friends that are also doing their basis and working with agronomists and you know i'll sometimes get their opinion so it's, it's, again, I'm making it through with the network of people that I have. And I know that's saving me some money in some regard, but obviously not everyone has access to friends who are trainee agronomists or people themselves aren't consultants who hear direct from DEFRA what we're doing yeah. and what they're trying to do. So I'm, I'm lucky in, in some circumstances like that. Yeah. Darren, what, what role do land agents play in all this? specifically in supporting new entrants you've said that i mean there will almost certainly be a fee for any advice but is there a broader role that could be played um well certainly from like a well from from one end, end of things agents are there to um i suppose meet their clients objectives like i said before and in the tenancy context they're there to help find the the best fit for their client and in some cases with the with the landlords with that commitment to new new entrants that'll be a key part of you know the agent's job i suppose looking at things from the other end the agents can and will help offer help when it comes to t- tenders and that'll include anyone that was would like to pay them some money i suppose uh including including new entrants so i think they you know they certainly have got a role we spent a lot of time many hours many calls with defra um head of their new entrant pilot scheme and i think we were in danger of exhausting the goodwill of the members that were willing to spend time on those on those calls because there's a lot of enthusiasm to ha- to you know try and address some of these barriers which weren't particularly taken forward with the with the pilot which always had quite a kind of rigid preconceived idea as to what that was going to going to involve and i suppose it was a little bit disappointing and hopefully um you know if the pilot is revisited and um expanded further we could kind of persuade them to get back around the table again to to talk about it we're gonna have to start to round this up um because we could go on talking about this all day but i wonder if we could just finish perhaps just going around the panel and if you could each give one key sort of uh, bit of advice uh, to chris and his journey but also perhaps to listeners on their journeys as well uh martin should we start with you uh, make sure you have a business plan and make sure you're out there marketing yourself as positively as you can in, in looking for tenancies and opportunities in farming. Cameron? I think you've got to be persistent. I think Chris is a great example of, you know, having written 25 letters and CVs around to lift different farms in his area. That's that's the sort of thing that you've got to do, I suppose. Um, and having, you know, had a couple of rejections in terms of t- tenancy offers recently um it's important to you know have some resilience and be able to bounce back um and those opportunities will you know come your way um and you'll start to be able to capitalize on you know some of them that are offered to you in the future and george yeah chris don't lose that obvious drive that you've got it's clearly infectious but you need to temper it with a bit of patience a bit of perseverance and make sure you're using your head and your heart in balance because you need both to be successful in this business. And Chris, we'll give you the final word because I, I appreciate this has probably been a bit of a strange experience um, having, having your own case discussed, but uh, has, has this been useful? Yeah, absolutely. And I hope um, 
other people can put themselves in my shoes and listen to this advice that I'm receiving and use it to their own benefit as well. I mean, I, I am, yeah, I, persistence is, is key to, uh, key to my business and I will just keep on going. But fortunately with my consultant's head as well, uh, that keeps my farming heart, uh, and head quite in balance. Cool. I think we will leave it on that point. Uh, that is it for today, but huge thanks to my guests, Chris Lake, George Dunn, Martin Lines, and Cameron Hughes for coming on today. Thank you also for listening and please do talk about this podcast with others if you got something from it. Uh, We'll have another similar episode for you in the spring uh, when we'll be focusing more on share farming and thinking outside the box when it comes to new entrant opportunities. For now though, I'm Ben Eagle. Thank you very much for listening and good luck with your own career path. This podcast was produced by Rural Park Media for the National Federation of Young Farmers Clubs. The presenter was Ben Eagle, and there was further editorial support from Sarah Palmer. The podcast was supported by DEFRA.